I enjoyed your talk on the Hagos. The problem with all of these outcomes scores a little bit is if you only report the change of the value between pre- and post-operative, we still don't know whether the patient is happy. So if you have only a 10 to 15% improvement, that means the patients are better than before, but they are still not good. So I think, um, therefore, we started to use what we call a patient acceptable symptom state. So we just asked them, can you live for the rest of your life with these symptoms? Which I think is very important to have also in these uh, outcome scores. And the next um, question is, or the second one, the HAGOS is, is a lengthy test. We have a lot of dropouts, specifically in our young patients. They don't take the time to fill out the tests. How do you manage that problem? Because we came back now to a core outcome measure index with only seven questions, less specific and missing some details, but at least more practical. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, nice meeting you as well. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I think on the first question, um, on it's yeah, it's a question of feeling better or feeling good. I think it's a very relevant one, and I think for the patient, it's probably. Uh, most relevant to feel good <laughs> and I think so I think that's the direction we want to move as well we need you want to know if they, the, the, the change is relevant to some point but you also know how many actually are now feeling good and um, so I agree with you so what we need to do is also to see uh, how many uh, what sort of at what um, where do you have to be at to feel good so and th I agree that's the pass sort of approach. Uh, I think statistically it still has some issues as well, but so it's not an easy job, but I, I agree with you on that one. So uh, there's no, mm -hmm. totally agree. I think we need to do both. And on the, uh, the thing with the many questions, um, that's, I mean, we don't have that, we haven't met that problem yet uh, in our population, so with the food bowlers or in our clinic. Um, and I think, I think it's a point that is being made very often that these are too many questions, and maybe it is. I just think that we have to be careful that we not we're not deciding that this is too many questions. So if the patients say this is too much for me, then I think we should act like you're doing. If it's just because we think it's it might be too much for them, then I don't think it's a problem. Do you do you, do you understand my yeah. point of view? No, I agree. <coughs> I think we have to 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 separate research projects between uh, and, and clinical routine. Uh, at the quality control in our hospitals, we need to, to provide information that our patients are improving by our procedures. And if we have too lengthy tests, they just don't fill them out. But if, if we introduce new techniques, I think the HAGOS is a perfect test, but as a routine measure, I just am a little bit concerned because we made this experience with the um, Oxford HIP score. I mean, we have dropouts after a year of about 30%. So. And, and, and then people are saying, yo, that's, that's unacceptable. And uh, this yeah. is related to the length yeah. of the tests. So I, I agree. And again, I would say I would fight as much to get my hacker score as one clinical test that you would use for your hip <coughs> assessment yet that you don't want to miss. So we would make sure that they, we get the Hagas information in the waiting room and we don't want them to leave before they've filled that out. <laughs> so because we think that inf information can be just as important as extending your assessment in the clinic. So we're really doing all we can to get the information. But I agree with you, if you just leave the uh, questionnaire or send them an email, you will, get, you will probably get that problem. So we really work hard on that. Hello, I'm uh, Philip Robinson. I'm a radiologist from the uh, United Kingdom. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, and uh, we did a number of studies years ago, and we wished, I wish we'd had your uh, questionnaire, because uh, you validated it so well. I mean, certainly in rheumatology studies, um, they don't consider a treatment effective unless there's a greater than 15 to 20% improvement, uh, and maybe we should apply that uh, to some of our uh, treatments in sports. But I wanted to ask you, you showed a nice slide where um, the adductor symptoms uh, produced a, a more significant drop uh, in, in your score. Did you apply that to other causes that people attribute to groin pain, such as pe people where you found inguinal uh, problems or iliopsoas problems? In, 
in that group, so we have different measures on that group. They will they will tend very. Uh, it's very unusual for them to have this as the uh, the only uh, entity. So very often they will have different things as well. So the only thing you can say about that group is that they all had a doctor related problems, mm -hmm. and we will then report what other kind of problems they will have. So, uh, but uh, yes, we will. We also have ingol uh, patients, and we also have hip patients, as I showed you. And we will try to isolate them as good as we can. But uh, there's no such thing as a FAI patient with only that or uh, an adductor related patient. So uh, that's another challenge, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure you know everything about. <laughs> and, and I agree. I mean, that's the problem we have. Uh, yeah. So our, uh, we have a large referrer bias. So yeah. if we're referred by a football club doctor or physiotherapist, they'll, they'll have they'll believe that it's inguinal or they'll believe it's a doctor or yeah. they'll call it osteitis pubis and that's all that's written. Yeah. Uh, so uh, having something that we can actually ask the patient yeah. uh, uh, to try and grade it would be, would be excellent. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ian McGuinness, one of the doctors with the national team in Qatar. Uh, Lars, it's, it's interesting you showed a picture of Lionel Messi kicking the ball with his right foot, which probably happens about 1% of the time in a game, certainly shooting, which looked as though that's what he was doing. And for me, it's, it, you know, the, the range of motion and the power generated through the, through the hip and groin. What massively important is the positioning of the standing leg when he kicks the ball. And I just wondered, you know, your thoughts on that because, um, you know, and the, and the incidence of groin pain in the kicking leg versus the, the standing leg. Uh, the, the Can you hear me? Uh, at least the incidence of pain is higher in the kicking leg than in the standing leg, according to the recent uh, paper that came out in the British Journal of Sports Medicine this year. But what I mean is, Lionel Messi, for example, probably kicks the ball 5% of the time with, yeah. with his right leg. So m my feeling, based on a long number of years in football, is the positioning of the standing leg in relation to the ball is massively important. You know, probably that the most important thing. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, it hasn't been included in the considerations in these papers I presented, but that's... That's definitely interesting to know that there's some practical experience about that, that mm. it may be important. So You know, if you watch the Dutch guy's analysis of the, of the player kicking the ball with maximal force, you'll see that his, his foot, his, his standing leg arrives immediately at the ball every time, perfectly on the level of the ball as he kicks through it. If you asked him to do it with his other side, you would find that he cannot judge the distance and that his foot would overreach or underreach. <laughs> but that's a, I think it's a good point that it could definitely change the range of motion if you don't uh, uh, hit correctly with the supporting leg. Mm -hmm. So it could change the range of motion of the kicking leg. Mm -hmm. so I think that's a good point to look into in, in future studies. So mm -hmm. thank you. Can I ask again? Of course. <laughs> um, I think it's a very interesting talk, and the decreased range of motion puts a lot of stress on the pelvic pelvis. Um, my question is, why was the range of motion decreased? Is it because the hip didn't move as well? Or is it because the muscles were stiff? Do you know that? Did you do any um, radiographic assessment? or Because I think that's where's the chicken and where's the egg. That's the same we are wondering. Thank you for the question. That's the same we are wondering, and um, we cannot say really, we don't have any numbers to make a point. We can say something about what we think is happening, and we th what we are thinking, and I think I speak on behalf of the tours, is that um, there is a kind of pain reaction, and a, there's a kind of atrokinematic reflex uh, bringing up muscle tone or tissue tone, that like, we, like you can call it. But we do not have Bit too big numbers to do a follow-up and see who, who is developing uh, pain. So we only have two two groups, three groups, two two healthy ones and one injured one. 
but we cannot make we cannot say if the, if the if there's a range of motion deficit that has been already there or is only following the period of pain so i think we're wondering the same